Hartelijk welkom allemaal, a warm welcome to everybody. Um, my name is Juri Albrecht, I'm the director of the Bali and I will try to lead this conversation tonight. Wonderful that you're all here um, because you like live performances and wonderful that people are home at home and watching our live stream, so this is live streamed um, as well. Um, remember to put out your phone, please, um, or put it on the, on the silent mode. This is a cooperation with the Holland Festival this evening. We're very happy to cooperate with the Holland Festival. We have done an evening, an evening with Fastan Lignecula, and this is the second evening we're doing with the associate artist, William Kentridge. It's a privilege to have you here, Mr. Kentridge. Um, I don't think you need much introduction, but um, as a South African visual artist, internationally acclaimed for drawings, films, theater, opera productions, um, his practice is born out of cross-fertilization of different styles and methods, and um, he's the associate, like I said, the associate artist, one of the two associate artists of the Holland Festival this year, and his uh, work uh, responds to legacies in colonialism and apartheid um, within the context of South Africa's social political landscape. Um, he founded the Center for the Less Good Idea, which actually resounds a lot um, here in the Bali, because um, uh, I, I always look at it as we, we do performances every night, and you know um, um, the the good practice shouldn't. I mean, the perfect practice shouldn't be the enemy of the good practice. I always say, you know, it's never good enough. Um, it's never finished. It's never. Um, it's all life. It's all life performed. It's never rehearsed, and so that that resounds um, very much with the practice we try to do here in the Bali, the Center for the Less Good Idea. It's wonderful, I think. Um, Raquel van Haver, uh, we invited to um, uh, speak with us tonight as well, contemporary artist. In 2012, you received a degree from the uh, HKU, the University of Fine Arts in Utrecht. Um, your work uh, paints complete stories about communities and human nature. It's, it's very um, um, uh, um, uh, heavily painted work. Recently, you had a solo exhibition in uh, the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam here, Spirits of the Soil, a wonderful uh, exhibition. You work normally on burlap, that's uh, canvas. Um, um, uh, no, it's not canvas, it's um, jute. Jute, that's the word. Yeah, <laughs> burlap. Um, combining oil and paint and charcoal and raisin and hair and paper and ash, and it's heavily textured um, paintings. Uh, there has, um, I want, I'm wondering, whom, whom of you have seen the exhibition at the Stedelijk Museum recently? Can I, I'm just wondering. Oh, that's wonderful. That's really wonderful. So we, we, we know, a lot of you know what we're talking about. Um, I was wondering, who, who've seen uh, one of the, uh, who've seen the head and the load recently uh, at the Holland Festival? Oh, that's, 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 that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we, we, we have an audience which understands a lot of the things we try to talk about. We will, we will try to have a conversation about art and how you make it and, and, and what, what, um, um, uh, where do you start with telling a story and who's allowed to tell stories or what is it important to, to, um, to draw from history or redraw history in many senses of the word. Um, and there's a big piece of paper here. It might be possible that that um, uh, some of you <laughs> sitting here do some drawing, but we will we will look at that. We'll um, um, <laughs> you draw. You draw. <laughs> yes. If there's artists in the room, you know, there, there actually there there are quite a few actually I sold. So it, it might be interesting to see whether um, uh, other people feel um, comfortable. Now. Um, um, as a, as, a, as a starting point um, um, uh, uh, to start a conversation, um, uh, and these are yeah these are the charcoal pieces. Um, if you if you I mean you both start with drawings often, um, uh, uh, whether it be on the burlap or whether it be on paper or um, uh, William Kendrick, If I um, uh, start with you, if you if you start having an idea, do you do you start having? I mean, having an idea, or you just start drawing away? Does it come out of the practice of drawing? I, mean, I think that you need an impulse for the drawing. I mean, but the, the, there always has to be a meeting between something that you're interested in and the material to think about it in. And charcoal is a very good medium for thinking in because it is so changeable. You can change the charcoal as quickly as you can change your mind. You wipe it with a cloth and it starts to disappear. Um, some artists start in color, think in color, 
Mm -hmm. And their first impulse would be to flood an area with a colour and to let that be the mode of thinking. And others, of which I'd count myself, need a line, they need a, a mark. But the, there's always a prehistory to drawing, which is the circling of the studio, the in your head imagining is the first line going to go from the bottom of the canvas to the other, trying to find yourself in front of it, in front of the sheet of paper to almost imprint the impulse towards it onto it. So the first few marks really set a tone very, very quickly. And then the rest of it is chasing it down and that part, that activity of making the drawing is the process of discovering what the drawing really is and what it's necessarily about. And you're saying the material to think in. Charcoal yes. is a good material to think in. Yes. I mean, if you're not an artist, that's a really weird thing to say, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's... It, uh, uh, let's find a concrete example to make it... So you could say, okay, let's announce a topic. Uh, memory, memory and geography. We can try to think about what is memory, what uh -huh. is geography. But if you're drawing a, you draw a body, you draw a body lying down, and you attack it with a cloth, immediately that body starts to dissolve, and what you're left with is a gray haze somewhere in the middle and a light area below it, and you're in the terrain of a landscape. And so what the drawing itself starts to do is suggest a connection between the disappearance of a figure or the disappearance of a memory and the emergence of a landscape, which later on you can try to track down what is the connection between the way we cannot hold on to memory and the way that a landscape obscures historical memory. Mm -hmm. That you have a massacre and in the first months after the massacre there's blood on the ground, there's ditches where bodies have been buried, but come back 20 years later there's almost nothing there. There's maybe a few neatly planted trees where the ditch had been, but you've got a hunt for traces in it. And in the same way, there are impulses we have which seem so unforgettable, so enormously strong, and then some years later, we wish we could still feel that same strength of feeling. So that's, that's a way in which making the drawing allows those questions even to emerge. And now I'm talking about them having done the drawing and been mm -hmm. alerted to them from the drawing, but that would be a way of thinking in a material. Because you're, you're nodding when William said, you know, material to think in, you were nodding because you know that same yes. process? Can you hear me? Sort of. I think we hear you. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, um, yeah and it, like for me also, like, you have different kind of artists and I think the both of us starting in drawing, like for us, the first line is the most important line and also like you have a blank paper here. This is the most scariest thing for me, actually, because the first line actually makes the work what it will be in the end. Mm -hmm. It's the start of a story. And uh, charcoal is a really easy uh, material to work in, especially can you, you can erase, you can add, you can make thick layers, you can, there's so many shades you can work in with charcoal. And um, it's just layer on layer on layer, memory on memory, and uh, space on space on space. So in that kind of sense, I'm totally agree. But I mean, the first line, um, William Kentridge, I mean, you erase a lot. So I mean, would you be scared for the first line? I mean, you can change anything, can you? You can change. I mean, maybe we start moving on towards the paper. It's going let's to be easier. Come, let's go there. It's, please, easier to, <laughs> it's easier to talk. Let's we're not going to make a drawing. I, I, was, I was afraid that they wouldn't. To, but we're not you know, going to. We're five you know, minutes into. And no, no. There was there was that system. There was a TV program where they would play the music and somebody would be playing, and then there were two programs. There was one which was flower arranging to music. So the song would start and people would put the different flowers in and as the song finished, the last dandelion was, would be placed in and then the vase would be shown. And there was also a person who used to do uh, drawings like that, that the music would play and you'd see these different lines and at the end, oh my God, there's a picture of someone skiing down the Alps. So we're not going to have skiing down the Alps or flower arranging. Sorry. No <laughs> Arte 5 um, painting. Yeah. <laughs> but the, to, I mean, the, what I was saying about marking it out. It may just be as simple as marks of that kind and okay that feels a bit low as a horizon. So yeah so once it's once you've had an hour of walking around gathering the energy then it can come in a few seconds the first 
And then I don't have, I usually have a very nice uh, chamois leather, which is very good. I've just got a handkerchief. Mm -hmm. But uh, then I mean it immediately, and this is not such a good paper, but it can, be, it, can be, it can be changed or erased. So the, the flexibility is that it's a very physical, I'm sure for you also, it's about, it's about the body. Drawing is always about, I mean, either you're drawing using your whole extent, or it's just from a shoulder, or it's just from an elbow, or it's just from a wrist or just from knuckles. So the, the kind of the, the ideas are always engendered with the sense of it being you in front of a sheet of paper physically present in the, in the studio. So it's also a thinking in the body as well as a thinking yeah, in charcoal. Yeah, but it's also the same like I used to be when I was small, I did some uh, martial arts. And the first okay. thing they learn actually is to stay grounded. Not what I'm doing right now, but yes. <laughs> but to stay grounded. It's the same actually with drawing because you have to stand in front of your paper to make this line to this line. Doesn't matter what you do, but you always have to stay grounded. And uh, in that way, like the physical way of just making something like really soft to like something really harsh, it makes sense of you and your body working together to only just make this movement, right? Instead of just trying to do something really weird. So it's just like trying to balance your whole body out only to make a tension between the paper and your charcoal. And that's why like the arrangement of something that was there and that was not there, you can just go over it and over it and over it again. And from that on, you just start to tell your own story. I mean, I think when you're talking about being grounded, it's both, it's both that sense, yes, of, mm -hmm. of yeah, being grounded. Yeah, you really grounded. like it. <laughs> but it's <laughs> also like a sense of relying on your body, knowing where it is. So I don't know if you saw the astonishing etchings at the Rembrandt exhibition at the... Yeah, just Rex ended Museum. Monday, just last day. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Where, you know, Rembrandt had good, fat Dutch fingers. He was a solid, a solid burger. And, when you're working at that scale, there's no way you can actually see what is underneath this mass of your hand where you're trying to draw the lines in an old woman's mouth here, which are half a millimeter long. So at a certain point, you have to rely that something between your head and your arm and your fingers knows exactly at which point those half millimeter lines need to be on the plate. It's not something you're looking at and studying and thinking. There's a sense of but it's written. trusting it, of rhythm. Yeah, because like if you have a face and you want to shade, it's just going, trying to make the same kind of uh, in-between spaces going on and on and on and make it thicker, 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 thicker. And in the end, uh, even I think you also work with music yeah. in your studio as well, because there's like a certain kind of bass or a tone. You can actually get yourself into a trance, what is quite important when you're in the studio, to get yourself in that space to make sure you're doing, you and your body and your mind are doing the right thing. Are you, are you drawing with music? Honor. I do. I mean, I'm a very bad listener to music in my studio. Um, it works in two ways. It works sometimes as an energy to, mm -hmm. and there's a lot. It also, it's part of the procrastination before the day's work starts. So there's a sense of, okay, I've got to start the drawing, but then there's a walking around the studio while you're thinking what it's going to be, trying to have some sense in your head of where the impulse will come. And then there's, uh, you stop and you say, I'll just check the email one last time. And then I'm about, no, I'll just go and have one last cup of coffee. And then you're about, uh, let's choose the music. And there are all these things which are kind of delaying the action of actually having to get down mm. to do the work. So the music sometimes works as a good energy. But in my studio, it also often works as a block so that I don't listen to all the work happening in the office at the edge of the studio. And then, and then I stop hearing the music becomes, gets filtered out, I realize and the CD finished an hour ago and I'm still working, or it's been on repeat and the same piece has been played for the last hour. And you have both been saying um, um, uh, 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 the material to think in a charcoal is very wonderful mm -hmm. because it's very tactile, because it's, because you, but you said it's also a, 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 a about the body, the body thinking. The yeah. body thinking, because it's, it's the, it's as far as you can get, because it's, 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 because no, but you can even actually put it on a stick, and then you actually just <laughs> okay. But <laughs> but it's like a dance. Mm -hmm. You have to balance your partner out, and it's the same actually with charcoal. You have to balance it out as far as you can reach on the papers. For this is um, just and, your and, space. And you're not having a picture in your head. No, there is, it's not. As, I mean, sometimes there is. There's a there's a sense of 
OK, we want to figure that the head will be somewhere there and it's going to be going across and we'll know the waist might be there. And, but it will be sort of mapped out in a very rough sense, but the mm -hmm. part really gets going when you, know, you start finding the shape in quite a crude way. Um, finding the shape. Yeah. yeah. So the uh, shape is already there's there a, and you find it. No, there's some people who are very you, good. They will know, OK, if you, there are some people who are drafts, you know, draftsmen and draftswomen who will imagine what a hand looks like like that and mm -hmm. what the shape of the elbow and the shoulder and the foreshortening all is. Um, and they'll put it down straight. And for me, it's a... Uh, and this, uh, this I'm interested to know if you have this, because for me, it seems such a strong sensation that you're busy drawing the, the shape that you're putting down here. And it seems kind of clear in your head, right, that's the shoulder, then we get to a waist, a leg, a knee, a foot, whatever it is. And then you step back to look at it, and you switch into a different person who is the critic, who is always disappointed with the idiot who's been drawing. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, because it's so clear when you're back here what things are wrong, and that's not the same as getting it right you at the front. And so that split between the looker and the maker is something that's, I think, endemic in the studio. Yeah, but it's like the balance. Like, for example, you start with a hat. That's the most easiest yeah. way to just make, like, a middle point, And then you just start to make, like, shoulders, breasts, whatever, whatever. Sometimes you just make, like, the, the legs way too long. So you're always trying to figure out, OK, does this size work? Does this size work? Does this work? Does this work? Until you found it, then you can just start to really make proper lines. And in the end, because sometimes it takes like five seconds, sometimes it takes like three days before you actually found that right spot. But also, you put a little bit of emotion in it. Because like what I, I notice, like when I'm in the studio and I want to have something mimic something, I'm trying actually to do the same with my own face. Because then I know exactly where like the muscles are and what So where do you everything. work with the mirror then for that, to see that? Not all the time, but, but, but sometimes, sometimes I just like try, try to feel also the tension in my face as well, then only to look at a mirror. Because like there's more to it, like you also for me the painting, because it's quite thick, I'm always trying to uh, copy uh, muscles underneath the skin. That's also how I actually build my work up, uh, especially also with the colors. I start with the reddish and then the skin over the top. Uh, but I'm always trying to navigate between those uh, muscles and skin and movement. Because a lot of your portraits or the, the faces and actually one of the, a lot of the bodies, you, you could think that the skin has been pulled off, that you see mm. the muscles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> is that... Is that um, on purpose? Or it's is not on purpose, but like actually like uh, how I start, I t like I'm, I'm, I'm making drawings, that's, that's my base, like drawings. And, uh, so first you do a drawing? Like what my, my grandfather uh, father always told me is how to actually make shades. And that's still actually starting to go into the painting as well. So like when I'm painting, I'm actually just like trying to do this and this and this and this over mm -hmm. top of it. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like scratching off and adding to it, peeling off and adding to it. But in between, you see also a new space starting to exist. And that is like a sort of a lifelessness or, or that, if you want to see it, on, on that person or on that image itself. See? Mm -hmm. So you're just mm -hmm. building up layers and layers, taking it up, building up layers and layers again. So in the end, I'm not hoping to have somebody look like his hat or his skin spilled off. But I'm actually just, because I'm building up the whole time, I'm trying to find the right balance for the form and the colors mm -hmm. and the thickness of the paint. And then I'm actually not really focusing on the image or that person or whatever it is. And the thickness of the paint? Mm -hmm. why, why is that important? Because it, it is actually um, quite you can a see, lot of paint. You can, with, you can see the youth sack through, through, like, if I'm, I'm making a painting, like, no, maybe bigger, something like this. And I have, like, people sitting here. I'm always trying to leave some of it just blank. So, actually, yeah, you, you can, can see a lot of you the... Can, you can see, the, actually, my, of, my, my drawings, because yeah. I, I work with chalk. So, you can see the white chalk going through the canvas. On top of that, you see a little bit of paint, then a thicker part of paint, and more thicker than other materials. So, you see, actually, my process, because I think the process, as well, is quite interesting. 
to yeah. So on purpose, you show a little bit of the. You can still see some of the drawing if you yeah, really. Some, really some, some, sometimes so you, you, it's 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 good enough to. You're able like to that. retrace as a vis, as a viewer uh, the process. Most of the time, yes. Yeah, and that's important. I think it's important to see a lot of layers in a work itself to mm -hmm. actually get more information out of it to read. And why is that important? What? Um, why? Yes. Yeah, maybe I, no, I maybe think for my you work, don't have to answer that. No, you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> you will. <laughs> it's important because it's not essential. Because it. That's a good it's one. I keep that one in mind. <laughs> <laughs> I think that as artists, we always have to defend the life-saving unnecessary things, but which are have no use but are completely essential. Mm -hmm. and, and 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 can you have an example of your work with it no use but essential in that in that sort of same way? Um, no, and an individual, I'll come, I'm sure you'll find one, but I want to go back to what uh, Raquel, Raquel said, was yeah. saying about, in this case, following the expressions, feeling what her mu muscles are doing in the, in the, no, that's me, I think, in the, <laughs> in the painting. So I do a lot of animation, and it's, it's not so much feeling the muscles, but it's definitely thinking, all right, I want a movement, this, this object, I wanted to move across the page and then shatter down on the floor. Mm -hmm. so, and that's a question then of performing that. It would be like saying, right, so we can count that into that's one Mississippi two. That's one and a third seconds. So that's about 34 frames, 34 frames long of shooting individual frames. So it would literally be, I'll do a, a line and feel it and say, all right, well, that's going to be, it will slow down there, so we'll have a few more frames, and it will speed up here. And then here it will start falling slowly, and then it will go down and check if that's the 34 frames. So it's a kind of a transformation of a movement into, it breaks down first into kind of numbers to try to think what speed that should be or how long a whole journey should be. But it is also rehearsed in the body and then transformed into the... Mm -hmm. It somehow would not be the same if you say to someone, well, show me the movement and put it down. It just needs to be felt inside you so that when you, these marks are made and when the drawing starts, you, know, you erase that and you redraw it and you redraw it and you redraw it as you're doing the animation so that when you play it back, it has hopefully a similar rhythm or intensity to what you've planned. And that's yeah. vital to feel that in, your, in yourself. So the way that things that are mechanical in the body become both instructions for what you're going to do on the sheet of paper and uh, demonstrations of it, as well as it working the other way from the sheet back into, your, into yourself. So, but it sounds as if you're uh, um, doing a choreography. It's a very it's boring choreography because it's really to the board and back mm -hmm. from yeah. it and then to the board and back mm -hmm. drawing. But it's a direct one. But it is a, there is a, there's a dance, but it's an, a kind of unchoreo... Yeah, there's moments of choreography, but... So, is that, if I try to understand what you're both yeah. saying, um, the drawing and the fact that the body is drawing it, this dictates a lot of the rhythm of the artwork. And, and is that... Is, I mean, it, there's these wonderful cartoons in the Victoria and Albert Museum of uh, Raphael his cartoons of, of his um, gobelins, where right. you, know, and you can see still his drawing. So, so if, you, if you look at sort of the bigger artist in art history, and, uh, and, and Raymond is a good example, there's a drawing under it. Is that, yeah. is that because it's bodies making this art? Because it's, that it's the ideal way of starting the sort of the under layer of something? I don't say it's the ideal way. It's just a way you can use, mm -hmm. but I think it's personal for everyone who starts with Most whatever probably. they want to Most start. Probably. Yeah. But I, think there's, I think what the 20th century certainly has made, one of the things of, was making a self-awareness of the activity of making of art part of the, part of the subject and part of the mm -hmm. heart of it. I think in other places you had a discipline of how to draw and you learnt it and then you trusted your motor memory to, to motor do Motor memory, that. yeah. I think there's extraordinary, I mean, Raphael's drawings and all the other great, great draftsmen through history, the, the years of drawing that they put in both as children, as apprentices, as apprentices to other great masters to the years after that, there's a kind of, I just, they are just astonishing uh, drawings to know where that sits inside them. 
You know, here we're so used to we have, we, you know, and to, to use a photograph as a reference to capture an attitude, and I need to do that what before one would have done in a sketchbook. Now I just take out my phone and take a photograph of you and say, oh, that's how the finger sits on top of the chair. Okay, and then, so when I come to draw it, I know, okay, it's fatter at the top, and then it's got a change of angle, and then the chair comes down, it, and have that kind of moment where you need to fix something very specifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you miss like a sort of layer inside, like a photograph is flattering everything. And especially the movement, what you actually want to feel in your own body, like what you were explaining with the movement in so many frames. You won't capture that in a photo. You won't capture that, but I use photographic references a huge Same amount here. for specific <laughs> things, absolutely. It works, but yeah. still like that kind of movement is still... Uh, and I think uh, if you start to draw, like start with modeling, like try yeah. to draw a model first before you go back to photo because you need to have an understanding of, of the other autonomy that's there. You do, you do. I mean, it's a, they're, they're different strategies for different pieces of work, whether it's how close you need it to be anatomically accurate for one moment and how loose it can be and what things shift and change and how it can dissolve. That, uh, but I think the thing is to try to find that within it, the fluidity that can come from mm -hmm. knowing that it is you at movement in front of the canvas in the studio. And then um, um, this is about the process of drawing and thinking while drawing and what your body allows you to draw or how. But then you decide on a topic, of course, before that. Or you don't. No, is it? I'm sure there is. Well, there's, yes, it's not like it's. It, it's not like aleatoric. It's not like saying, let me make circles and no. then see what it becomes. There's no. a, there is. No, for me, there's always a kind of an impulse. So if, even with the animated films, I may well know an image I want and find that and then hope that that will provoke other images and other thoughts of how the film can develop. So it's not as random as anything comes onto the canvas. It's not, I don't work no. that way. And it's I'd not be surprised if you were... That Depends well. if I'm just like making doodles, like things like making a circle will actually work. But uh, if I really actually want to make something, I already know a little, slightly little what to make. And it's still always a surprise because then like to balance things out on paper, that's always different from what you had in mind. But you had something in mind? Sort of. And how do, yeah. you, how do you decide on whether it's going to be... Um, this or that? I mean, where, where, where does that start? I think that's the well, critic. <laughs> I think, it, I mean, it has many different routes. Sometimes it's an image you've been working on before that you want to develop, or it's a new set of thoughts. I'm working on a project about the Sybil, a small chamber opera, about um, the prophets and prophecy and telling the future. Mm -hmm. And that comes out of a short project that Alexander Calder made in 1968 of mobiles turning on stage, on an opera stage. So I thought, well, I want something that revolves, that has an echo of the Calder. And that put me in mind of the story of the Sibyl in uh, Sicily, no, mm -hmm. in, in Italy, where you would do the Cumaean Sibyl in which you would approach her. She lived in her cave and you would approach her with your questions about your life. And she would write the answers down on an oak leaf and there'd be this pile of oak leaves at the entrance of her cave. And you would go and take your oak leaf but there would always be a wind that would blow the oak leaves around so you never knew if you were getting your fate or someone else's fate. So this image of the Calder put me in mind of the story of the leaves turning. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of enough to start the process over. So I knew that leaves and leaves come from trees and leaves are also like leaves of the pages of a book, like the end of Commedia dell'arte, where it talks about all the leaves of the Sibyl being gathered together in one book. So there are sets of associations which are also clues as to what should be drawing. So what that's prompted was both a lot of drawings of trees on many sheets of paper that can flap in the wind, some actual quite uh, naturalist drawings of different leaves that are on these different pages trees. which turn and pages of a book, uh, some sculptures which turn and become one object and as you turn them they become another object. So it's, I mean, so those are prompted by this one quick story going through my head of the memory of the story of the of the Sibyl. Sibyl. And from that, very specific and other less specific images come and then you're, then you just have, then you can't keep up with the 
following of the possibilities and the ways that they can... You can't keep up? Well, you can't, because then you think, well, what's a contemporary civil? It's about the algorithm. The algorithm mm -hmm. is, the, is what predicts the future for us now and not the ancient sibyls. You know, we yeah, look at our phone and that tells us what the weather will be rather than going to the sibyl. And we check all our heart rates and everything and that rather than the sibyl will tell us how long we're going to live. And so, there's that, so, so that becomes a secondary section about starving the algorithm. Mm -hmm. And how does one represent that? What does an algorithm look like when you're turning it into an animation or a drawing? There's, of course, a Sybil in the Matrix movie where she predicts the future, and there's the Sybil in Michelangelo's painting of the, of, Sistine, of the Sistine Chapel. Sistine Chapel. So, so let's so start you, with you can, copies of the Sistine. Mm -hmm. you can so, go. That's, that's, so it's not to say it's, it's random, but you set up a chain of associations and within that, there is a lot of material to Yes, and it's also with. like your past. What, what did you encounter in life before you come to this story or to other stories? And what comes to all together? What makes you what you make, you know? Like, he will make totally different work than I because we totally share a different past. We don't share. So mm -hmm. because of that, all those things make us unique as persons, as artists, as ideas. We still can, like, so many artists are actually making the same kind of art, but still they do it differently because they encounter different things. They work with different material, they work with different ideas, they speak with different people. So from that point on, there's so many different layers and, uh, fr like, how do you say that? Um, ways to perceive things as an artist, different hooks, different kind of corners to go to one subject, same subject. So, yeah. But you um, um, start out with um, the idea that you um, having a group of people around some bottles to, who drink. I mean, you... you no, I didn't start. Like, they, they were, in the end, people were drinking, and I was like, oh, that's cool. But I, I, for me, for, for the new show, actually, um, uh, the only thing that was told by the museum was, OK, you can just pick something from the collection. That was all. Mm -hmm. And because they're now actually doing something with Maria images. And by coincidence, I found out that the space actually had eight corners. And that eight corner symbol is actually the symbol for Maria. Things started to fall in place. Uh, the idea was to go to Colombia, OK, quite Catholic. Uh, I wanted to do something with my heritage. OK, I'm adopted, so I do want to do something you, with my birth mother. You, was, you were born in women, Colombia yeah, and then the mother. again. So mm -hmm. then things actually start to come and build up a story. And I still don't know what it will be. But I know it, it leads me to something. And mm -hmm. like I, I just follow this. Like it's almost like the broad, uh, broad crumbs. Yes, yeah. broad yeah. crumbs. And until I found something that is fine by me, enough fine by me to start to make work. So it's first to collect memories, to collect new things, to uh, start to build on something. Mm -hmm. And then it's more or less like a puzzle to see if it fits. And then maybe I will paint again guys who are drinking beer. But mm -hmm. who knows? That could, that could very well be. <laughs> but, yeah. but, it's, um, but you also take pictures. Yes. And then you, um, uh, uh, but then you, you would have a, a premeditated idea probably of what you want to, or, or is it just a random picture of a, of a situation you happen to stumble upon? Uh, sometimes, sometimes I coordinate the event, mm -hmm. but that comes actually because I've been tr through something and I want to re, uh, yeah, redo it again. Re actually, recreate. yes, mm -hmm. recreate. So, uh, and that comes from memory. So still, it's a setup. So it's not real. Uh, sometimes it's just uh, that I'm just walking with my phone and stumble on people and I find it quite interesting. Sometimes it's just to remember. And a memory and a photo are totally different. Like a memory, there's emotions, a photo is flat. So it's nice to have a photo with you uh, because if I actually uh, painted reality, mm -hmm. Wouldn't be like that. No. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> so it's it's like there's so many different layers, and photos will help to uh, draw back to that memory, but still the memory does the work. Is it important to to um, put your memory on paper or on canvas to keep it there? I think for me, uh, I need to make these paintings to uh, understand. Understand what? Whatever I want to understand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, but uh, if it's important, for me it is sometimes, but not always. 
it's so because, fake. Because I read somewhere that you said it's important to be able to keep memories alive. <coughs> Me? Yeah. But I said that. Um, I don't think it's important to keep memories alive as a kind of um, mantra for making art. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to keep memories alive as a society to know where we come from. Yeah. And because you, you, you put it in the context of in a country which would, loves to um, uh, uh, not remember its past. Yes, I mean, like I think there's a debate. There's some mm -hmm. people say the only hope for any country is to have very strong amnesia. Mm -hmm. That countries that have been through civil war need amnesia more than they need memory. Yeah. In South Africa, it was very clear we needed m memory more than amnesia at the end of apartheid. We needed to not pretend that nothing had happened in all those years. So that was... Uh, that was kind of vital, but that's as a kind of a civic project, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was, mm -hmm. was a vital one. Um, to remember? Or yes, to both to remember in this case also to find and out, to discover what, mm -hmm. what, had, what had been happening. Um, and I mean the questions of memory and of the emotional place of memory is the raw material of artists and writers always. So yeah. Kind of a natural set of inquiries for artists also to be connected to. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean one is doing illustrations of that process. You hope that that process and those questions come out in the work and through the work and in people's encounters with the work, but you have to also not set it as the agenda. You have to find, you have to make a safe space for real stupidity in the studio. Your own stupidity. Your own stupidity is kind of vital. Mm -hmm. um, because as it is, the world, you know, you've, you've got these images, you've got these thoughts, and then they've got to be taken apart. They get turned into fragments as anything does in the studio. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're taking a fragment of the story, a bit of that photograph you've seen in a newspaper report. All of those things are the things that are your own private dreams and memories. So it's some things that are in the public domain and some things that are very private. private. Yeah. And then they get, trans they, they get taken apart and turned into these 32 marks on the sheet of paper, which is a you know, singularly stupid activity. And you may have started, you may have been prompted by a rage about something that's happening in the world as an impulse, but in the studio that shifts and changes. Is the shoulder in the right place? Is the leg too high? Is it too dark? Can we see what's being done? It dissolves into a series of practical and formal questions in the hope that in the end, when those are put together, they'll go back out and re return to the world with an emotional charge, with a meaning, with a question, all of that. But, I mean, it's, it's not the same as psychoanalysis, but it's in the same thing that you've got to allow a space for free association, for uh, an uncertainty between the analyst and the patient in the space, which is like the space of the studio. And I'm never sure if the paper is the analyst and the artist is the patient or which way around. But there is a sense of hoping that not knowing doesn't mean there's no meaning mm -hmm. and that recognition becomes a key attribute rather than knowing in advance. So you draw a line and you recognize what it is that you've seen and it may not be identical to what you first yeah, but thought as in your example head. what we talked the last yeah. time about about other subconsciousness and dreaming like how does men dream like also for everybody we dream we don't know what we will dream the next step the next second but in your heads already reality for what what will yeah. be already will build up on the next and the next and the next and it's the same actually with the drawings like from this point to this point you don't know which way you go but like you you will go eventually you will wake up yeah, you have a starting point and like this place here the in between us of that dream but also of the line that's the most important way how to follow and i think also for for, for artists to to create that space of dreaming or practice or anything that's like one of the most interesting spaces and uh, also the practice self is one of the most interesting things to look at instead of the end result because the end result is is done but there's such more information also in there then. But I'm interested in dreaming. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that a literal source for you sometimes, remembering a dream, I think getting I, clues I, I from think a I dream? I think I put things together in a dream, but I won't say I will, I never tried. I, I, I have seen some things that were quite interesting, but. In dreams? 
Oh, beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the, the tr with dreams often, you make such intelligent statements in your dream and you hang on to it till you wake up. And then you repeat it to yourself and say, what? This was the witty <laughs> remark, this was the devastating insight I had, and it's like nothing. So one also has to be... But it's the safest place for it us is. to be and to yeah. say the most stupidest things. Nobody yeah. hears if you don't speak. But is it, is it um, um, you're just saying you want to understand or you want to uh, um, understand your own biography or things out of your past or take them, or you said, it, I'm not sure whether I'm the patient or the paper is the, is the, is the, is the, is the doctor, or, um, or is the artist the doctor and the audience the patient? Because you're making it for an audience. It is all about no, it's a, it's in your it's studio, I mean but then there's... No, it's not making it for an audience in such a simple way. No? No, I mean, it's, it's making it for someone else to see, which is not necessarily the same as an audience. I mean, here, let me not let me talk on my behalf or not, mm. but I always <laughs> think and that there, there has to be a fundamental inadequacy to be an artist, that you're never enough in yourself. If you're enough in yourself, you can go through the world, have friendships, have relationships, and that's fine. But artists somehow have this need to leave junk behind them, pieces of paper, canvases, mm -hmm. songs. There Opera. has to be something that comes out of them that is not the same as them, that they can step away from and an element of them still stays on the sheet of paper. And then they can see other people looking at the sheet of paper and in there looking at the sheet of the paper, they kind of know that they exist. And it's a, so maybe the, maybe the drawing is the symptom or the neurosis. Mm -hmm. the, the illness. That's the, the illness that's going to be repeated, and it is. You think of the same drawing done again and again and again and again. And uh, so it's much more perverse than <laughs> it being made just for an audience, I think. But, 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 but it has to be seen. It's not it has between to be you seen. and the paper. It's not between yeah, you but and... Sometimes it's only between you and the paper, and nobody sees it. Well, you see it as the artist, as viewer, you yes. see it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that conversation, sometimes it's a private conversation and sometimes it's an open pro conversation because you wanted to give it to the audience. Share it, yeah. 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 But, I mean, it's not art if it not doesn't have no, an audience, I, I, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. No, that, I, that I'm not uh, disputing. When mm -hmm. I started as an artist, in the first, I had two sort of periods. I had a first period just after art school, and so I was about 25, and then stopped for four or five years and came back when I was about 30. And in the first period, it was very much with a kind of Leninist view of art making. What is to be done? What mm -hmm. are the, you know, we're in crisis in South Africa, what are the images that need to be seen? Mm -hmm. uh, what is it that shop stewards need to show them so they'll understand their class consciousness and make the revolution? What is, and it became always thinking on behalf of an imagined audience. I know, so I will instruct someone who knows less than me, a trade unionist, uh, someone else, the audience, thinking in terms of the audience. And that drove me into a corner. I realized I was always, the audience was always smarter than I was or stupider, but it could never think on behalf of other people. There was always a bad faith somewhere inherent in that activity. And when I came back when I was 30, it was on the basis that it only really had to make sense for me and for the two or three people otherwise looking around. And if with good fortune, other people were interested in it. That was great. But I didn't have to think on their behalf. Will they understand this? Will they, you know, will they have to know what that foot means? Will they have to understand all those different elements? And that opened up the possibility of becoming an artist for me, of not having that, that weight on one's shoulder of what one ought to be doing. And then one made things, you know, there were a lot of works which I think had a much better and closer connection to what was happening in South Africa than the image which I felt I ought to make as a piece of good works. Mm -hmm. But there's like one, one discussion and there's like somebody told me uh, a colored or black artist always has to make like a uh, social work. It's always, it talks always about this and this and this and this and this. Like, do you also think that that's the case or is it just something people really need to let go? Well, when I was starting as a student in South Africa, and then you would say that the primary form of in the 1970s, in the early 70s, was that American color field, New York color field art was kind of the, the model. So it was Helen Frankenthal and Morris Louis, um, that kind of large color abstraction, and that was what was done. 
And our art teacher, the person who ran the small art foundation I was part of, who was a fantastic person, he posed a question once. In the very first months of being in the school where canvas and paint was, seemed to be the norm, he said, why did I think it was, why, to the class, he said, why did we think it was that in South Africa, abstract painting was done by white artists and that the figure was only done by black artists? And he gave us the challenge to say, your challenge this week is to go and do figurative drawing and not feel that you have to be in the... And for me, that was such a... It was a, an opening and a liberation not to have to work with colour and to work with uh, line drawing and to work with figuration because at that stage, figuration was seen as so much not part of the modernist project. And the modernist project in those years um, were completely ones of surface and edge and mark and touch, mm -hmm. and the, as if the highest point of art making was the most extreme formalism. And it took a long time to, and a project to find other strands of modernism that one didn't have to renounce the modernist project, but that went with, with a kind of connection to the world, whether it's the Neue Sachlichkeit in Germany, or a project in the Soviet Union, or Max Beckmann, people who said, no, the world is still so interesting, and so you, the work can both be interesting formally and completely connected to it. And I think there is, but at the same time, there are a number of, there was a whole school of black South African artists coming from the same art teacher mm -hmm. who did the reverse, who started working as color field, uh, abstract painters with paper pulp with acrylics. And so that broke down that clear dichotomy. But again, now, all these years later, there is a pressure. And it's a pressure both of peers and it's a pressure of the market. And because and I'm worried about the market, that it's like so almost making it sexy, almost Making to, what sexy, uh, To talk about this topic as uh, okay. to start and take stuff out and just frame it as it should not to be framed. Mm -hmm. It can be anything. Uh, and then sell it. We just spoke about basil, art basil, like to have something that's really like totally capitalistic place to have actually somebody who's just in the studio making the drawings. So they sometimes they just rip it out of band, like out of context and just put it on a platform and, and what, makes, what? are making a difference. So I'm like, I'm always curious how that works and how artists should stay real or how does the art market actually and if affect this? If you try to answer your question, you just put, put out. I mean, do artists of color always need to be more? There, there are more questions from the audience or the other to, I think, artists of color, yes. And should you uh, um, fall in line with that idea or should you just think, I mean, should you? I think be I should just be whatever I want to do uh, mm -hmm. with my work, with what I'm saying, but it, that doesn't make the world turns around and just says, okay, we stop with these questions. Mm -hmm. There's always will be people who will question my work as a Colombian female young artist, totally different than Sir Kentridge's work. So that's like a way of seeing and trying to navigate in between this art world. So that's why I was asking this question, because mm. I mm. think that's quite kind of interesting to ask ourselves, how do we put ourselves out there with this really strong critical, uh, let's say collectors or like the, the audience and uh, us as artists who just want to draw or just want to understand and... I mean, I think the other thing is, which I'm sure Rocco also feel that if, in the end one makes the work not even to find the answers but to try to find what the questions are, mm -hmm. what are the ignorances we have inside us that are provoking the work. So even a piece like The Head and the Load, which ends up as a piece about Africa and the First World War, mm -hmm. starts as a whole series of different questions um, about the ignorance of, of my, own, my own ignorance about Africa and the First World War. Uh, then as, it develop, as the piece develops and it's clear that's the topic, there's a question of can one talk seriously or can one have an intervention about the nature of history which specifically says we won't have the lecture explaining what the piece is about. Mm -hmm. It will be fragmentary, it will be a collage, not just a co because a collage is a kind of art form that we're interested in which we can't escape it from the 20th century onwards, but because an understanding of history that understands it as this provisional construction of a coherence from a collage of fragments 
is a better way of actually understanding history than the linear narrative of necessity you get in a written scholarly text. Mm -hmm. So, and that's, I mean, that we didn't know. We didn't know until we did it. There was a lecture written, which was for one of the performers, of it, and we kept on trying to hold our nerve never to use that lecture, which would have explained what the whole piece was about. No. sure. Um, no. But it was not clear whether, once it, uh, we put it on stage, whether it would be an incoherent series of Dadaist nonsense pieces of poetry. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's, it, to me, it's also a piece... Um, I'm an historian by training. Yeah. Um, I taught the origins of the First World War um, as a first-year course in Oxford. Yeah. So it's... It, um, I mean, the First World War is something I... And even... Um, uh, I was aware of some of the history you put into it. But it's not... For me as an historian, it's not a piece on a, a part of history. Yeah. Um, it's a piece about the character of what it is if time flows, the character of history, what it is if, if layer upon layer happens, and it's a collage. So it's, it, to me, it tells something about the flowing of time and of what we call history. But you could easily say, of course, that it's about a forgotten story uh, about people who died, who have never been named, um, and it's unearthing that story. Um, so you could interpreted it as instructing people on a forget, forgotten history. I mean, it becomes both of those things, it's clear. I mean, there's a decision as we're doing it to say, as we're researching it, and you realize that there was a conscious decision of the colonial governments not to award medals to African soldiers. Yeah, you mentioned that. In so they would no. not get no. medals. Then there was a decision not to invite them to the victory parade in 1919, when soldiers from Australia and New Zealand and white soldiers came to parade in London. For so there's constructed, you discover that there are constructed ignorances, in other words, ones that people want you to be ignorant mm -hmm. of. And then there are other ignorance that one is responsible for oneself, which is saying one is so besotted with the Western Front and the all quiet on the Western Front and all of the images of the Baron von Richthofen and the dogfights in the air and the sop with camels and all of the big rats in the trenches, all of those things has a kind of extraordinary power and romance to it now that one is so filled with it that one isn't really interested in finding out the other stories. And then even when you know some of the other stories, one doesn't start put together the bigger the bigger picture. So all of those things get uncovered in the process of making the film. I mean, for us, it was a revelation. I'd known the letter of John Chalembui saying, why should we go to war? This isn't our war. This is a war of rich men and bankers and title men. Let them go to war in Europe and get shot. What's it for us? And then reading through the transcripts of the Chamber of Deputies in France, where the members of the Chamber of Deputies deputies were saying, no, we, you know, this is our war. We're not going to let any black people into it. And the black members of the Chamber of Deputies were saying, we demand the right to fight in the war. We demand the right to die as French citizens. We offer a harvest of devotion. And so that's kind of shocking to read that in the Hansard, in the transcripts of the... And you realize there's a kind of an extraordinary paradox, which is not just about the war, but about all these questions of colonial power, and who wants to be part of which society, of which culture, how does that uh, resolve in that complete contradictory and paradoxical way? And that then becomes kind of the heart. And that, that both, it's a revelation and it also gives an enormous energy for thinking about it in terms of the music, in terms of movement, in terms of language that is spoken or not spoken. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not the moments of insight and moments of very specific pinning things down but then they have to be used in a way that has an openness to discover the form. But uh, originally you said, I read somewhere, that you were interested in being a political artist when you were not even 20. Yes. And then um, uh, a critique told you, well, maybe you worry about the art first and then the political might you know, follow suit. Um, um, uh, but yes, ironically, that was advice given to me by Clement Greenberg, yeah. who was the high priest of formalism, of touch and edge and surface, and Jules Zelisky and the others. Yeah. And uh, his view, which I don't believe, he, he happened to be in Johannesburg, and as an art student I met him, he said that he actually himself preferred figurative art. It just so happened that at the moment in the world all the best artists were abstract artists. Um, which I, don't, I think he protested too much. But in a way, afterwards, I understood that's not bad advice. Because mm -hmm. in, in the end, the work, I'm sure that you also find, the work reveals who you are. 
-hmm. Whatever the, if it's people drinking beer or not drinking beer, there's an underlying story that will come out that is, in the end, going to be about who we are. True, true, true. Also, like, because what you were just pointing out, uh, we spoke about is the, the play Hatta and the Kum. Mm -hmm. Actually, also spoke, because like, also, like, somebody sitting there, I know, you know, it's more about this, but uh, the past of uh, Anton de Kom, like Surinamese uh, freedom fighter, actually came also to the Netherlands and then actually fought also on the side of the Dutch mm -hmm. uh, against actually the guys who actually were throwing him out of, of, of Suriname. So like also in this kind of sense, like we are finding ourselves in like quite similar spaces with similar stories. And to actually find these stories and connect them again just gives, gives us a deeper insight exactly what you say who we are. So are you as an artist trying to um, rewrite history or at least re-show history or unearth other stories is that is is that part of your responsibility or of your I think it's connecting and what makes sense for us to connect mm -hmm. uh, but I think also it's our choice to show what we want to show um, mm -hmm. I think also you have um, when you are like uh, having a big platform and you're allowed to show the things and say the things you want to say mm -hmm. and nobody can touch you or reach you. I think also you have to give back to, 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 to the rest, uh, bring other artists up, show other artists exactly what you did actually also with the center, to just put people there, give like space for, for young generations to talk about uh, ideas and media and just give, give things out of hand, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, but you're saying, I'm, um, because for instance, your next project, you're um, going to S South America mm -hmm. to um, research people who haven't been portrayed, who um, haven't been... It's, it's, it's more that I actually want to investigate uh, what if, the what if, if, if I was still here, what if. If so you were I still just, living there. You yes, mean, mm -hmm. and I just want to speak with a lot of people who can answer my what if. Um, to uh, document it, archive it, mm -hmm. and see if I can find connections over there to make new work. And that's, that's the whole thing, the frame wh where I work in. I don't know what it is. I have an idea. It's going to be big, and I actually is going to use a lot of metal and weird stuff to, to put on the canvas. That's what I know, but until I found the right form only by sketching, seeing photos, he hearing these stories, um, finding new materials to work with, or, or patterns, or mythological animals, I don't know. I still don't know what to paint. No. At all. And um, William, you, yeah. um, by doing this huge project of um, actually, or somewhat becoming about time, about what, what it is, what history is, if uh, multi-layered, or palimpsest, you could call it, or what, what, you, what you erase and get uh, under it. Um, and you're saying to Raquel, in the end, the art will reveal who you are. Are you a political activist in that respect? Are you surprised that after all those years, you are? <laughs> that no. your art shows you? No, 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 no. I, I used to be part in the early 1990s when there was a lot of Sturmandrang in South Africa maneuvering what was going to happen at the time of the first uh, democratic elections. I was part of various art collectives that were very involved in these questions and I realized that every single argument I'd fought for I'd lost in these committees mm -hmm. and it wasn't because the arguments were kind of stupid or wrong but because there were always people who were prepared to come to one more meeting or two more meetings than I could ever face and the meetings would happen and say I think in the light of new material we must revisit the decision we made last week about allowing this production to travel or not allowing this production and so that I understood that I didn't have the temperament for meetings necessary to be a political activist. <laughs> um, the form became impossible. And I thought the only thing I can do as a demonstration, as a way of working, is to show the activity of the studio. Just because the understanding of what was happening also made a space that seemed so obvious to me, but maybe came from working in the studio, of the place of contradiction, of absurdity, of paradox within what one thinks of as straight line politics. 
the unintended results that, that things have. Something which seems useful here, but because it's so instrumentalized, is very destructive down the line. In the most, in the most simple case, in, during the anti-apartheid years, when there was huge support from anti-apartheid activists in Holland and many other places, the arts became instrumentalized. They were one of the weapons of the ANC in the national liberation uh, struggle. Mm -hmm. I was in fact last in the Bali here in 1988 when there was a conference called CASA, Culture in Another South Africa, a meeting of artists from South Africa and underground art people who are part of the ANC underground and all met together in this wonderful gathering in Amsterdam at that time. And there was a sense of artists being part of that whole debate and argument. But one of the results was that when victory had been won and democracy came, the instrumental use, art had finished its instrumental use. And it became of no interest to the new state that came in. And artists mm -hmm. who said, OK, our job is simply to support and do posters and draw one raised fist after another endlessly, um, have used their sell-by dates. And now it's really not what we're going to be interested in. So this, the public support of the arts in South Africa is calamitous. And that's one of the consequences of the way we all so happily embrace an instrumental view of what art should of what art should be. So I think those kinds of paradoxes and unintended consequences, one has to understand that the world is, uh, that the politics, that politics needs to understand those categories as well. So in that sense, there is a political polemic, but it's against the simple nature of political art. Mm -hmm. And um... so I don't think of myself as a political artist. Mm -hmm. But there is a politics embedded in the, in the center for the less good idea, which is both about how you make art with finding things at the edges of a project, but it's also about the, uh, the destructiveness of every huge idea that we've had, that all the certainty of grand ideas always come with enormous violence at their edges and authoritarianism. So politically, one needs to find the less good idea also. It's important to not have the good and great idea, but the less Well, you have idea, to understand that dangerous. every great idea needs to be supported by an army of soldiers, whether, mm -hmm. it's, uh, mm. you know, whether it's apartheid, which needed its army around it, or whether it's uh, Stalinism that needed its army around it. Mm -hmm. And that all the ideas that we will beat happiness into people have been over the ages. So just, I mean, every project of uh, missionaries is about saying, we know what's best, we will come, and even if we have to uh, kill you while we baptize you, we will bring you into the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. And to understand that's still where we are in the 21st century, all of those. And there, there are no good solutions. There are only bad solutions. It doesn't help to say, oh, well, therefore, we'll do nothing with the rest of the world. We're not connected to, to other people. But to try to find a multiplicity of different solutions to try to avoid the big calamities and not be doing nothing. No big, great ideas, but um, Raquel van Haar was just saying that some of the work she makes is also rooted in the fact that, you know, what if I would have been still living in Colombia, or what if um, um, uh, investigating her own biography yeah. or her... Um, and it struck me, looking uh, uh, also at the, your, your films in the eye at the moment, which are wonderful, the, the ten, ten films, the... Um, you delve, of course, into a lot of your own um, uh, history, into your mm -hmm. personal life, very personal, some of it, because some of the people who are there, um, uh, uh, Eckstein, or, um, yeah. is actually, after a while, looking at it. it it's yeah. the same images. It's very, very personal uh, in many respects. But it's also, um, I was thinking, Soho Eckstein is, um, um, is all sort of the bad things uh, a lot of fascists have been saying about Jews. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, uh, it's you know the anti-Semitic bile. You can mm -hmm. you, you can the images of it. Mm. Um, is that possible for you to do that because you are a Jewish artist, or is that has there no connection to that? Is that? No, I'm sure it has a connection. I mean, the the films were made without a sense that they were going to be in a public audience. I didn't question the names of the people, who they were. Uh, my grandfather in his pinstripe suit on the beach was one of the characters, but he was also like the industrialists in the drawings done from, from trade unions. 
And in fact, when they were first shown in London, there was a complaint of anti-Semitism against the films and was investigated by the Board of Deputies of British Jews, and then it was all kind of given a clean bill of health. Mm -hmm. But uh, <laughs> well, that's one. It's a little bit. It's a little. It was a little bit like the. Uh, there was a drawing in the one of the early films, and the films had to go to the South African Publications Control Board mm. in that stage, and it, any film that was made went to be censored, and it came back. There was official censorship. Uh, there was a no. no, no. This was this is in 1989. This was before the end of apartheid. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so sex and politics were not allowed in films and in other things. And it came back with a report from the uh, Publications Control Board uh, with a report that this film contains scenes of sex and fellatio, however, they are sufficiently badly drawn not to give offence. <laughs> and so it was passed. Wonderful. No. <laughs> but the, well, the thing I wanted to say to uh, Raquel about the journey to Colombia to find these things, I mean, I think that it will be astonishingly rich. Even if it's not, you don't find the things you specifically wanted. There'll be so many details that you can't predict in advance. That's why it's so open. And I think right. that's the, that, if you, if you can hang on to those strange things at the edges, mm -hmm. that sort well, of feed work for years. What always works, in the, like, because uh, as I paint, I always bring back the palette, like the colors of my previous, visits to whatever country. So when I was in Zimbabwe, everything turned orange. Lagos was everything green because of the, like, the rain season. So every time it takes something, I always know I take something back, but I cannot predict what it is. And that makes it also so interesting to see. You know, mm. you go someplace, like you're traveling, you always get so many new ideas and just uh, stuff to you. Like people really are willing to give something to you because you, they know you're a traveler. If you're not a traveller, nobody will talk to you. They, you're just a person who actually just drops by, but that's it. So that makes also that space so interesting to see um, what can happen and what will happen for the near future to make me work. And if nothing happens, that's fine as well. I think even if nothing mm -hmm. happens, there will be so many things at the edges mm. and it's really hanging on to, not hanging on to, just bringing them back into your studio, wherever it is. Raquel, if I, <laughs> if I ask the same thing about who's um, um, allowing to draw what, huh? mm -hmm. um, I asked William whether you know, the fact that he's Jewish makes it more easier or diff more difficult to, to uh, draw these uh, 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 characters in his movies. Mm -hmm. or, um, I, I, what would you think about it? Are you, are you, because um, you've been mentioned often, if I read the interviews, mm -hmm. a, uh, a woman of color, so that makes you uh, paint you literally or figure into a corner. Is, is, are you different, allowed to do different things than other artists? Um, it, I think it depends. Like what I always say to everybody, don't talk about things you don't know anything of. You know, like don't talk. Just keep your mouth shut if you don't know what you're saying. Mm -hmm. That's good advice to anybody, I would say. Yeah, <laughs> but it's, I think, also the same with what I'm doing. Like, when I portrait people, most of the time I portrait my friends. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's from, like, a generous way to show uh, off with my friends on canvas. Look at this, we're eating some dinner, mm -hmm. or we're having mm -hmm. a party over there, it look, whatever. It looks pretty good party. So actually, I'm yeah. always yeah. trying to connect with whatever group or individual uh, to get a deep understanding in what that person is doing. Mm -hmm. So it's not only a model, it's somebody I actually going to be friend with uh, to actually share space and share thoughts about whatever. Um, so uh, for me, I'm always trying to navigate between spaces. Like I grew up here, but I'm always uh, on the road trying to find new stuff. Uh, I'm, I'm always scared of uh, being portrayed as the artist who actually looking for uh, exotic things. Mm -hmm. I'm always scared of that. Why is, uh, why is that so? Uh, because sometimes, um, I think sometimes it seems like it. Um, and that's just because I'm a perfectionist, so I just want to do the right thing. I want to portray that person in, if I want to portray you, for example, mm -hmm. and normally it takes me three months to make photos of you, talk with you, to do my investigation right, and maybe it took me now two and a half months. 
and always feel bad about those other two. The last two weeks you <laughs> yes. didn't put in. Yeah. So, th but that's mm -hmm. my own personal kind of uh, mm -hmm. battle. Um, but after that, I'm trying to make a compilation, not only by you, but maybe uh, men I met in the past who were looking like you or talking like you. Uh, people who would remind me on TV with you. So it's never, ever a one-on-one -on -one portrait. It's yeah. always things I take back from my own past and, and I make it into. a sort of yeah. you, but it won't never be you. And that's actually also the thing uh, for me where I'm always playing with, like my, my field, my art field, that I'm always trying to take back from memories or other stuff and to mix it. Mm -hmm. So also it will get to people's memories as well. But you're saying um, I'm wary of being portrayed as looking for something exotic. Hmm? Yes. Um, um, I, had a, I had a, a nice um, conversation about this with a gallerist from New York. Mm -hmm. And th this was actually the first thing he asked me, like, why did you paint what you painted? And nobody actually here actually questioned this. So I was happy with him to ask me th this question so we could sit down and actually have a real conversation about it. And in the end, he understood. Mm -hmm. But it's necessary to ask. But on the other hand, I would say, um, uh, I carefully looked at your wonderful exhibition in the Stedelijk. Um I took my children and I took a very old um, uh, aunt who's mm -hmm. uh, an art professor and over 80. And uh, my children are under 20. And, um, and it speaks to a lot of different audiences, but to me it's, um, it looks a lot like uh, uh, it's also um, in the same vein of Van Gogh. That's not exotic at all, that's as Dutch as you can get. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, but um, then the references are there. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, But it just depends what you want to see in a work. Yes, sure. That's what you were yeah. saying as yeah. well. Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah, I like to see Giotto in it and Van Gogh. And, that, um, and I like Giotto and I like Van Gogh, so that's... Um, <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> But um, uh, uh, so the fact that you, but I'm, I'm interested in, in why you think it's exotic, because then it has to do more with your color or with where you were born than you as a painter. Is that, is that your, weir your, your weariness about um, the exotic? Or? It can be colors, it can be maybe signs or symbols, mm -hmm. but it, it can be everything. It doesn't need to be necessary about the color of skin or uh, something else. It can be also be like something as in male, dominant mm -hmm. male. Why do I paint <coughs> male all the time? Why yeah. not females? Like al already right. that, yeah, yeah. that yeah. way it can mm -hmm. be like for me, I, I, I did some uh, research uh, about masculinity, but mm -hmm. from my perspective. Yeah. But most of the time people came to me, but why male? Because they didn't saw this research, but it was more like an inner research. How do I fit in in a male dominant culture yeah so in that kind of way like you always bump into something and mm -hmm. not everybody understands no. and in that way i just want to be have it as clear as possible before i'm going to show it no. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> uh -huh. i mean to go back to your question about uh, what was on, who can one paint? What are the, I think it's not a question of what are the objects or what are the people that you're drawing, but it's a, for me it's a very strong understanding that it's uh, of my position as a white South African male, and you can keep refining it, white South African middle-aged or now old elderly middle-aged uh, Jewish male, a white South African elderly Jewish male whose surname used to be Kantorovich, but is in anglicized, so it's got that. And you can define yourself more and more precisely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, smaller and smaller and smaller. Smaller and yeah. smaller and mm -hmm. smaller to mm -hmm. you know, all of those whose first name starts with a letter lower than the letter T in the alphabet. You can, def you can make it minute. But I don't think it, it precludes you from looking at different parts of the world, but it's to do it as if. You cannot do it as if you are the person necessarily that you're doing. And that's why I'm, I'm not a novelist. There are novelists, I think, have this great ability or the key thing to imagine themselves into the life and the history or the persona of characters they're writing. Mine always are stuck with Soho or Felix, which are both kind of different versions of myself. And that's always the perspective outwards. So it's a very limited view outwards. Mm -hmm. And if I had a better imagination of other lives, I'm sure one could then draw it from other perspectives. So I do understand also what you're saying about you know, 
things that you have no idea usually be, that usually becomes clear in the in the work, and that's why there are so many men novelists that have written such poor women characters in their books, and so many men filmmakers that have made such poor characters of the women in their films, and there are some fantastic men directors that have made great women characters uh, in their films. So it's not a matter of this can't be done, but I think you're right, that when you have no knowledge and you're trying to pretend you have knowledge of an inner life or another life, uh, it comes through. It's, I think it's still working. Yeah. No, it no, it's not. No. Well, then we have another solution for that. Can we? Can we have this one turned on? on? Yeah, yeah, I think we can. Yeah. yeah. Oh, much better. Yeah. Okay. Um, what do you <laughs> now? Forgot about what I was about saying. things that one doesn't know about. Not talking about. What yeah. Not talking about the things um, you don't know. Yeah, we, we we can try to give a speech, uh, for example, about some perfect big computer that just runs through from the moon and back, like we can try. Uh, I think we can actually do yeah. a really great job, but yeah. I don't think that will work uh, if people are actually gonna build that computer. It yeah. doesn't work. So in, in, in that kind of way, like um, trying to understand uh, what your topic is, like it, it, it's actually more or less like a friendship or a romance. You want to get to know your partner, right? You really want to be a truthful, uh, and honest with your partner, and your partner is going to be honest with you again. And I think also, like, when you put that on paper, because, like, novelists can write, we can draw. Like, this, this is our language. So let us just, like, try to put it on paper and then see what's coming out from there. And yep. that I, mean, I mean, I understand, of course, it's, it, it, it comes out of yourself. It's your therapy. It's your body who does it. It's, it's, it's as personal as it gets, of course. Um, on the other hand, um, it's also about universal topics. It's about, um, yeah, I would say, that the, the wonderful performance we saw um, is about the, the, the substance of time. At least that is what it, what it speaks to me about that, which is as, probably as universal as we human beings can get to think about time. <laughs> um, uh, I don't think there's much Bigger. I mean, you can think about God, but God is. You know, so, I mean, time is may, maybe even sort of the, the biggest. So it's it's very universal, and it's not it's um, it's not personal. It's no, not. but it's, it's so it, interesting it, what you're <laughs> saying because it's while we were making this piece, not for one minute did the topic come up. This is going to be about time. Mm -hmm. It was so not on the agenda. There's some, there was another a person who saw the play, the piece, the head on the load, and came out and said, "This was such a strong anti-war piece of theatre." And I've seen so many anti-war pieces of theatre. So, and we said, that's mm -hmm. so interesting because the term anti-war was not a phrase that ever came up once in the two and a half years of making... Of working on it. Of yeah. making, so <laughs> that's a sense mm -hmm. in which if you give the, the piece the benefit of the doubt, allow it to expand, there's an openness to different things, not being false interpretations, but possible mm -hmm. senses that... that so it is, yes. When you say it now, I think, yes. Re going through the whole a piece of theatre, and yes, it is also about time, and yes, it is a kind of but, anti But it was place. also, like, we spoke about this, and what interested was, like, you had, like, uh, the place where, like, all the texts were and the images, yeah. and then you actually made the same space here on stage. stage. So, actually, in between here, this double existence of time and space became, like, the, mm -hmm. that in-between space. So, in a way, you were working, and I asked you, how did you start? Is this, yeah. Was it just one thing, or was there were there multiple things no, so the, brought in? Okay, so we had a to, again to do it in its diagrammatic form. There's a screen in the back, yeah. in the back, and there's a stage in the front, yeah. and there's a projector over here, which casts its image the size of the screen. So if you are standing over here, your shadow is only a little bit higher than you are. If you're standing over here, then your shadow is a much bigger shadow. And if you're standing over here, your shadow is the full 10 meters of the stage. So that was the first thing. So what that meant is that a lot of the time was walking across the stage saying, no, OK, this has got to be our tram line, marking that down. Measuring. Measuring to say, this is where your shadow will fill the whole, 
wall, and if you're back here, it will small. So in fact, the key thing is, are these four steps, if you're a dancer or a person moving, where your shadow will expand and become much smaller and expand and become much smaller. But then it also changes, because if we're looking at it, here's the stage, and here's a projector, and here's a projector, then the beam of light goes from the projector to the back wall, so that there's a continuous piece of light all across the screen. The whole screen is lit. Mm -hmm. But if you're walking across, if you're walking across at the back, then you're casting a shadow all the way across. But if you're walking across at the front, you're out of the light, there's no shadow. You have a tiny piece of shadow being cast. Then you're out of the light all the way to here. And here there's your shadow being cast. And so we suddenly had to deal with all of those questions of every one in the cast being out of it and how do we still keep our shadows full. So they're things that have no, nothing to do with the topic of the pity of war, the passage of mm -hmm, time. Mm -hmm. And those are the things that you solve in the hope that somewhere embedded in everything This has everything else. to do with the passage of time because no. you can't be seen here and you're know. walking across. No, but we're not thinking. Right. And no. You're right. No, you're right, in fact, in the sense that we said no. that when you get into the light and you're mm -hmm. carrying it. When you get into, into the light. When you get uh, into yeah. the light, you have to walk really slowly so that you're slowly, because exactly. your shadow is going yeah. so quickly. And as soon as you get out of the light, speed up to get to the next piece. <laughs> and then again, you yeah. slow down. So there's this crazy, uh, there's a kind of an invisible dance in order to get the appearance of a kind of coherence that flows. So it's a kind of quantum view of time. So yeah. now we're talking about, yeah, we could go yeah. a lot, a lot, a lot we, about We could time. do sinus and cosinus. Yeah. We could, um, uh, uh, waves or waves yeah. of light or waves of, I mean, you, you I mean, and, and, but you weren't, think, I mean, out of the technique, Came this came, came the thing. So it can be about time, it can be about all, you know, the pity of war, mm -hmm. but it's about a series of other questions when you're making it. And I think that's, that's what I'm saying. If we'd set ourselves, let's do a piece about the, how terrible war is. Mm -hmm. Let's do a piece about the strangeness of the passage of time. Mm -hmm. We've done other pieces about time, so that's a bad example, because I have done that as a kind of a thinking theme. But even there, we had to break time, when we were thinking about time, into a material to think in. Yeah. And so thinking about time, that was thinking about cinema, so you could imagine time running backwards. Mm -hmm. Thinking about music, which has a certain rhythm you expect, so if you slow it down or speed it up, you're messing with time. Of course, with animation, you're always busy with time because you've got the time of the gesture that's going to be carried out. But then you know it might take you a one second gesture, may take you half a day to actually do the drawings for it. So the one second expands into the half day of doing it. And then you may compress it into half a second if you double the speed of the projection at the end. So it becomes this malleable. And you have your roll of film, which is your one kilo of time. You know, a kilo of yeah. film is 10 minutes of screen time. You're carrying it in your hand, that piece, of, that piece of time. So there's always the transformation from the abstract into the very physical and material. Out of the very personal. And yeah. mixed yeah. up with the, with the personal. You said something, I read, you said something about, I'm coming back to um, who's to tell what and then I'm drawing to a close, maybe, and see whether the others um, are. But um, you said um, that, um, that, uh, the, that art is actually a bastardization, that it's, um, and, and, and that has probably to do a lot with the unexpected outcomes, like Raquel said, where you're traveling somewhere and you, and you yourself describe it. But, um, and as apartheid, you, I read somewhere that you said, apart, if apartheid shows us anything, it's about, the fact that if you go into your identity and if you're um, uh, uh, split up, like you said, I'm a middle-aged mm -hmm. uh, uh, Jewish man who uh, has a, a K uh, mm -hmm. in, his <laughs> yeah. in his surname. Um, if it splits up um, uh, in identities, um, uh, that's sort of the, the, the worst thing which could happen is things like South Africa or you have many drawings where there's Auschwitz in it or what. Uh, um, so you're you don't think actually that it's a good idea to be um, to to say that only people who have that real experience can make that art. No, absolutely not. But I say you just have to acknowledge where you yourself 
you know, to, to be aware of where you, are, you yourself are. But I think the one thing South Africa showed us, one was the, the danger of reductive identity politics, where mm -hmm. the society was defined, you're black, so you have to live there, you're white, so you have to live there, you're mixed race, so you have to go and live in that ghetto over there. As a broad project, what that becomes. Um, and the other thing that South Africa showed us was the value of bastardy. The you know, people who learn things the very fact of having being a homo not being a homogenous society, of having so many different strands, is the one hope there is for the for the country. An example I often give, but I'll give it again here, is that the the second greatest citizen of Johannesburg uh, was Mahatma Gandhi, uh, man who lived there for 20 years and developed his political philosophy while living in Johannesburg, the beginning of the last century and. We'll give the number one position to Nelson Mandela, who lived in Johannesburg also in the years after his release from prison. But Gandhi developed his, uh, his philosophy of Sajjadraga, of, of retreating to find the strength in passive passivity, not because he was an Indian mystic or he'd understood Indian spirituality and that had been the tradition he'd grown up with, um, he came to South Africa as a very English lawyer, trained in the Inns of Court in London to be a lawyer for the Gujarat community in Johannesburg. And he found his roots and his philosophy through the root of being introduced by a Jewish Johannesburg architect to a book by John Ruskin, the English aesthete, that referenced Madame Blavatsky, this crazy Russian mystic, who had this misunderstood idea of talking to the dead in reference to the Bhagavad Gita of India. So he gets back eventually to Indian spirituality and the Bhagavad Gita through this completely mixed up, messed up route. And it's one of the things that shows me is the value of mistranslation, of being able to jump across different contexts and cultures, and of what you get from half hearing and half understanding, the imaginative pressure that pushes on you to make sense. Um, and so that for me has been the kind of a key image of celebrating the fragmentary nature of what comes towards us rather than hoping for a deep centering. Understand? I'm, I'm going to see whether there's people who think we Just for our fingers. <laughs> Um, if there's anybody wanting to ask something, maybe say something, but not long statements. <laughs> but a question is over uh, there's a question in the back over there. Oh, wait a you come too. Otherwise, people at home can't hear you. At the top. <laughs> So it's not searching for the center? No. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Konkais, that's wonderful. It's a good question and a good answer. <laughs> and there's somebody over here who. Uh, Jan, too? Oh, there's first one there and then. Give here and now. Yep. <laughs> yes, I have a question for Raquel. Hi. Um, you mentioned that uh, you're scared of being viewed as an artist um, who's constantly looking for exotic things because it sometimes looks like that it, that it is that you are, correct? Um, sometimes I think, yes. Okay. Uh, I'm wondering if that fear maybe might be linked to the box view of the, exotic, of the exoticization of the unknown? Uh, I think it is uh, definitely actually comes from a fear that I developed when I was young. Uh, in a way, how I had to perceive myself in a kind, kind of white family. So uh, I'm always aware of the fact what I can think of what other people can think, you know? So I'm always shifting between that space and my own space and the space I was like, let's say, 20 years ago. So I think the fear comes from there. 
There's a qu question here in the first row. <laughs> Yo. Here, here. Oh. Well, there's. Oh. I mean, yeah. Okay, thank. Um, for William Kentridge, you work quite a lot with dance now as well. Do you find that that, because it's so non-specific, also leaves that openness for different interpretations? Yes, I mean, I do a lot of work with dancers, partly because there are such remarkable dancers in Johannesburg who are also happy to work with me. They are astonishing dancers. But I think what dance does do almost more in its deep structure. When you can think of the world either as a, as a series of facts, like here is a table, and he, you understand there's a photo, that's the table, that's a fact. Or you can understand it more as an animation that, yes, it is a table, but if we run the film backwards, we go from the table to the plank, to the branch of the tree, to the tree shriveling, and we go forwards, and the tree becomes a piece of junk, it gets set on fire, there's smoke and ash, and the table disappears. So you can either see it as a fact or one moment in a process. And what dance does, it gives us a deep sense of the world as process. Dance is always about the moving, unfolding from one moment into another. It's a kind of a demonstration of animation, of transformation. And I think that's, that was probably the deep reason why uh, dances or yeah, people who find their meaning in movement is key for a lot of the projects. Hi, yeah, for uh, William Kentridge, um, we were talking uh, a lot about the identity and the location of the artist. And I'm wondering what happens then when you're, because you're embodied uh, in the process of, of making art and what happens to that once it gets to the art. And if I should be looking at a drawing like that and seeing it in a very simplistic kind of fashion as, look, there we have a white male, Jewish, and so forth, mm -hmm. drawing, or if I should be thinking, no, one of the richnesses of art is that it queers things and it allows bastardry, and, and so we see that, or is it that it takes on the identity in a way of the viewer? So depending on who the viewer is, precisely because you have that dynamic between the art and the one who views, that it takes on that identity. Well, I think the, the art is always a, a kind of a membrane. So on that, you have things which come onto the sheet of paper, which are the marks which are there. And you can say, OK, behind them is my biography, as it were, making them. But then you also have you as the viewer seeing that and seeing those shapes. And what you do without being able to stop yourself is keep projecting, keep projecting into it in an attempt to recognize it, to find connections, to see what it is. And it may stop the whole time. No, just rubbish marks on paper, just rubbish marks on paper. Just, or you must, oh, I can start to see an angle of a body that's lying on the ground. The way you may do looking at a, um, at a cloud, which is just a cloud, but you start seeing into it. So I think that sense of the drawing or the artwork being a membrane somewhere between the world coming to meet the sheet of paper and what we do when we look at it. Because whenever we look at it or wherever you read, part of it is prediction, part of it is a memory of other images that are similar to it. Other artists that have just made kind of random scribbles on a big sheet of paper, those kind of sit in one's head, children's drawings and doodles. So those are, and that obviously, there's certain commonalities, because people have had similar experiences, and there are others which are completely idiosyncratic because of the different biographies that we've had. But it's, it's absolutely the membrane as you know, one of the edges, an extended edge of where we, meet the, where we meet the world. What is of us, what we project onto it, and what the world gives coming towards us, and how we find our edge, or the, our Markov blanket, as I believe it's now described in neurological terms, um, where we know we end, and that's where we believe the world starts. Uh, hi, maybe a question for both of you. The topic is uh, concealed uh, stories. Uh, do you think that artists who are par who feel a part of a concealed uh, uh, story like, for instance, slavery here in Holland. Do you think they, have, they feel this urge or feel uh, more obliged 
to uh, be instrumental to tell this story? I think like artists, it depends what kind of artist you are and again, your background. If it's something you necessarily do have to deal with every day, of course, probably you'll talk about it. But if it's like a thing that occurs maybe once or twice a year or maybe never, will you talk about it? Like, will you talk about a topic you don't know? Oh, sorry, I'll come back to You said uh, you felt uh, a pressure or you, you said... Um, uh, uh, artists of color, I, I don't remember exactly mm -hmm. how you said it, feel this pressure. Is it about um, that? I think that there is a group uh, pressure from the outside world that uh, box or frames us to talk about these kind of topics. And uh, we always have to deal with these kind of questions and then we will deconstruct them and ask also why they're coming from and how to deal with that. But uh, I think artists who don't deal with those things can also focus on other stuff at the same time. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a division. There are some people, whether they're artists or novelists or musicians, who are driven by a particular story or history, and they need to write or tell that story. And there are others who are driven by a need to be making something, whatever it is, and then the hope is that the making will find a subject that is not random or without interest, but it's a different uh, impulse. I mean, as a child, I had such a sense of saying, I want to draw, but I don't know what I want to draw. I know I want to draw, but I, is it a tree? Is it a landscape? Is it a house? Is it a stick figure? Um, and being frustrated by that inability. And other people say, I don't know how to draw, but I know I have to tell the story of what happened to my grandmother and her dogs. Um, and then they're, they're off. And I kind of envy those people who have such a clear impulse to this is the story I want to tell. Yes? Yes, hello. I have a question for uh, William, and that is that uh, it's clear that you mentioned that uh, privately, as a person, you may be uh, furious with what happens in the world, but that in the studio you are first and foremost an artist, and this is the way, of course, that I see you as an artist foremost. However, uh, your narration, the, nar the narrative of your work uh, is perceived as sometimes strongly political. In this sense, we watched uh, Head and the Load, and I was very surprised myself at the end, when after this onslaught of really um, the dance and the strong stories, the overpowering uh, uh, artistry, you showed a whole series, a huge series, I would think four or five huge video screens with African leaders from the post-Second World War. Um, I don't know exactly their names, but yeah. types like Bokassa. Yeah. Yeah. In what light should I view this? I think uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I want to just one correct, correct one thing. When you say you may be prompted by anger, but as an artist, you have to leave it. It's not that you have to leave it. You can keep that impulse. But in the studio, of necessity, it's it dissolves into something different. It's not an abandonment of it. It's transformed into the numbers, into the distances, into all those other things which in themselves aren't, you're not making a mark saying, this is such a sad mark because it's a terrible thing that I'm drawing. That, that doesn't work. That doesn't happen. There's a joy in the activity of working in the studio, whatever the subject matter is. The, just to answer the other question, at the end of the Head and the Load, which is about Africa in the First World War, there are images of African independence of Patrice Lumumba, of Nyerere, of other people who led Africa to independence in the 1950s and 60s. And it's there because the impulse of that contradiction in the time of the First World War was about people who believed that if they took part in the war, they would be given independence, they would be given rights, and they weren't. But it was sowed the seeds in a number of the leaders afterwards who came out of that experience, or their fathers came out of that experience of dissolution of promises not being kept in the First World War. So it's, it was kind of the epilogue 
to what happened. It's also the stepping stone halfway between 1918 and uh, 1960s and where we are now. So it was done as a, as a link. So it just, I mean, the piece was about the First World War, but also about the paradoxes of colonialism. And that was an important leap in it. So some members of the company hated it. They fought it right through to the end. Big debates about should it be in, should it be out, should it be in, should it be out. And um, I liked it as a counterpoint to the kind of song that's being sung. And because I thought it's great to put Patrice Lumumba's face on large scale in Europe to affirm his presence and who he was. So without having a specific agenda why it had, those are the kind of thoughts that were behind the impulse to keep it there. Um, I think I'm looking for the last question. Um, and somebody's lucky to have the last question. Yeah. Um, you both make really wonderful layered work. Um, and you know, there's this whole process of discovery while you are making it. Well, my question is, how do you know and when do you know that it's finished? <laughs> That's a very nice last question. <laughs> yes, now it's finished. Um, I, I think you're always looking for a balance. Uh, it's actually the same when you just uh, prepared some dinner and you have to fill your plate. When, when do you stop? You know when to stop. <laughs> or you don't. <laughs> or you don't, but, <laughs> but you will know after. <laughs> yes. Um, they, they, used to, they, they, they say sometimes that an artist should always have someone standing behind him with a hammer in the hand to let him know when the work is finished. Um, you don't. I mean, with animation, it's easy because it's provisional. It can keep on changing. You never have to get to it. You get to the end when the evening comes or when you've run out of film or a new impulse is stronger. Um, a key thing is to try to end with the same energy you began so it doesn't get tightened and tightened and tightened down. But that's usually a wish. It usually does yeah. tighten down. Yeah. <laughs> That was a wonderful last question. It was one of the many questions actually I had written on the cards, um, which yeah, I didn't what ask. What kind of questions did you and, um, 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 and there are many more questions, of course, to be asked, and there are many, 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 many more things to say about b both your work. Um, thank you both very, very much for uh, um, uh, um, taking part in this weird experiment. It's a drawing lesson, it's a conversation, it's something wonderful to do, and it's wonderful that you both um, took the risk to think out loud and participate partake in such an experiment. Thank you, thank you very much for uh, talking about your work because I know that's uh, 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 sort of a lot to ask because you make work which should be seen and not be talked about. So it's wonderful that you actually both were willing to participate in this. Uh, thank you, thank you very, very much. It's a great pleasure and a great honor. And thank you very much for coming here. And a lot of applause for those two. Thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>